Well, welcome, friends, to Philosophy of Religion. We will be getting knee or waist or neck deep very soon in what's called analytic philosophy of religion, where we'll be going through some theological arguments, you know, little bits of logical um, um, inference. But I wanted to begin the course with a sort of reminder of maybe where it all comes from. So we can, we can talk about God and argue about God and logicize about God in God's absence. But perhaps we're talking about God because we once met him, her, it. And so even if, even if there is no God, there definitely is and has been experience of God. That is humans sincerely undergoing very powerful, called mystical experiences where to, to the experiencers it seems quite clear they are making contact with something that is not local, not human, not of this world, not, 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 not. In fact, that word not, we'll talk a bit about today, that when, when you encounter something very, very different from um, what you're used to and what your people are used to, you may find that uh, uh, the right words escape you, that uh, your conceptual scheme, your language cannot hold that thing in. You have a hard time describing it. And um, you revert to negatives. So that it, the best way or the only way you have to describe this thing is in terms of what it's not. What was that? Well, uh, God, I, it wasn't human. <laughs> it's a har harder time saying what it was, but wasn't human, wasn't me. So uh, we'll call this thing the holy today. The holy is a nice word, which gets us a little bit maybe outside of theistic uh, nomenclature, um, because the thing we meet might be God, it might be gods, it might be I mean, who knows what it is? Uh, we'll try to find out, but the holy is a nice general term, maybe, if you've got to give it a kind of positive attribute when you call this thing the holy, you're saying, well, it's special, uh, but you're not yet specifying whether it was God in particular. Uh, maybe it's you, maybe you are holy and you're the deepest parts of your soul and you, you very rarely access those parts and maybe in deep meditation or prayer or in intense near-death experiences you make contact with something but that thing is just you and um, um, me, me, you are the holy. So this, this word the holy which um, well it's an old word but we'll talk about a, a 20th century sort of theory around it in a moment. Um, this, this approach of the holy, approach toward the holy, is uh, where we'll begin the course or begin by talking about it, if not undergoing it. And uh, we will also be getting into sort of philosophical literature in this course. You'll be reading um, some contemporary and maybe not so contemporary philosophers on God and God's attributes and related. Uh, but we're starting the course with a little bit of literature. Um, on the left, you see an image of, well, this is a Googled image of 
a dude opening a door and entering the light. And it's sort of how this story, the approach of Al Mutasim, ends. The approach of Al Mutasim by um, the Argentinian writer Borges is a weird, short little story. And even to call it a story um, is to maybe presume too much. Uh, like the holy itself, this little work, this little story is hard to describe. I mean, is it a short story? It doesn't seem like one. If you hit, if you just pick it up, if you just found it sitting on the seat beside you on the subway on loose leaf paper and you started reading it, you'd have a hard time, I think, um, determining what it was you were reading. Or am I reading an actual old book review? It presents itself as a kind of book review, uh, like a short capsule book review you might read in a in a literary journal um, and it, so it presents itself as as being sort of factual a, a factual account of an actual book a sort of detective story written in supposedly written in india in uh in the early 20th century so um this is it's it's a work of fiction, but it's a work of fiction which presents itself as a book review about another work of fiction. So there, I mean, there are all these layers. Kind of a maybe a terrible way to start this course with such a, with such a complex, confusing reading. But maybe maybe that's appropriate too if we're beginning with this 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 approach of the holy. Uh, the approach of the holy is the approach of something hard to describe. And so we're beginning the course with a reading you need to approach as the reader, as the student, and I need to approach as the, I guess here I'm the, the lecturer trying to talk about it. And you can see I've really said very little about it substantively. I've kind of, as we speak about the holy, we speak in negatives. It's not this, it's not that. It's not exactly fiction or it doesn't present itself as that. Okay. What's this story about? This is uh, um, uh, this is a story about the approach of the holy, and the holy in this story is is sort of symbolized by this character named Al Mutasim. Al Mutasim, who's this sort of sagely? Uh, I picture him. I know the name is has Islamic connotation, but. Um, picture him as a sort of Chinese Buddha-like uh, um, sedentary holy man just seated somewhere behind this door in the light probably generating the light and you move towards him and he has his audience with you and this story well it's a book review about a story the the story embedded in the book review is about a young man let's say it's him who makes a journey over many years to um, meet this man, Al Mutasim. And the story ends, uh, I mean, the actual story that the book review is about ends just as the main character, who was a young, was he a law student on the, on the lam after an apparent murder? This law student is just opening the door and entering the court of Al Mutasim. So there's an implied success to the quest or the journey of the young man, but we, the reader, aren't let into the room to actually meet Al Mutasim. So the title is appropriate. The the story and the book review cover the approach. Uh, the thing itself cannot be encountered. And I, I would suggest that Borges, the, the Argentinian fiction writer who wrote this fake book review, I mean, I should say a little bit more about that. Borges would do this. He would, he, he's very well known for this kind of, it goes by many names. One name is sort of metafiction, which is kind of, it's fiction, but it's fiction about fiction. And this is a great case of that. Borges has given us a work of fiction, but it's a work of fiction which presents to you, the reader, as a book review of another work of fiction. That other work of fiction 
was probably just a cool idea for a book or a story that Bohr has had in his head. And I think partly out of just his sort of magisterial efficiency and intelligence, he would sometimes figure that I've got a great idea. There's no need to write a 200 page novel about it or a 20 page book about it or a script for a Black Mirror episode that will take 53 minutes to play out when the, the idea itself is can be presented in a few sentences. And uh, I, uh, so what I'll do is I'll just write a fake book review. I'll pretend that there was a book which expounded this idea and then I'll just write a review of the book and the review can take maybe two pages. And so uh, this, this is a great way to present in the capsule form a, a good idea. And uh, Borges was certainly a writer of ideas. His stories were really, I mean, they weren't character driven. They were driven by sort of philosophical uh, um, notions and hypotheses. So um, there are surely a number of reasons Borges chose this book review format to present the journey of this character um, in Tamit al Mutasim. But I think maybe for us, the, the best reason Borges would have had for doing it this way is he's writing a story about an encounter with the holy, with something which is beyond description, beyond depiction. You know, there is in Islam, and Borges would have been aware of this, in Islam a strong injunction, maybe the strongest of all the, uh, the popular world religious traditions, uh, against depictions of the divine, right? You're not supposed to... Uh, picture like Michelangelo did on the Sistine Chapel, Allah. You can describe Allah through words or through these abstractions, but you can't picture Allah and, and you shouldn't even do that for the uh, the Prophet Muhammad by, by Islamic tradition. And this is sort of an Islamic story in that sense in that, uh, I mean, it's got this sort of Islamist title, but Borges is also refraining from showing us the god or the monster or the alien god, uh, Borges is just taking us up to the uh, threshold and then letting our imagination do the rest, perhaps. So the encounter with the holy, with Al-Mutasim, is at the end of the story. In fact, it's, it's beyond the end of the story. It's outside the story itself. So Al-Mutasim, this maybe I called him a Buddha-like um, sedentary guru character, transcends the story, is outside of it, uh, yet generates it. The action of the story, the dramatic momentum of the story is generated by this character. The story is all about the effort of this individual to get to Al-Mutasim. He learns, he hears a little bit about this figure or actually just hypothesizes the reality of this character Al-Mutasim from a whiff of a whiff of a rumor, of a wink, of a hint of a, I mean, just infers that in this world, there must be something of this grandeur and magnificence and then begins his quest to kind of approach this entity he's inferred. So the, the story, meaning the action of the, the, this character, right, his arc, is generated by the existence of Al-Mutasim or the hypothesized existence. And I don't think Borges is being very cagey here. I think he, he it's very clear. I mean, he, he discusses this in, in the footnote to the review that Al-Mutasim is, is perhaps a metaphor for the divine, for God. And um, very appropriately then, Al-Mutasim is outside the world, the story, 
that you know it's set in in 20th century india in uh, i think pre-independence uh, india and Almutasim is outside of that. We never meet him inside that world of events. Yet he's he's generated it. And that's, again, like God. God has generated, by definition, has generated this world we all move within. But God is somehow outside of it, too. That's We're, we're getting close to some of the key um, criteria of the divine, sort of part of the definition of God. We will spend quite a bit of um, mental energy in this course considering the, the definition of God and I think we're getting to a couple of the attributes here more on that as we proceed so let's let's talk about the second work uh, you've been asked to read you've been given uh, a um, excerpt a chapter from uh, this classic science fiction novel, which is less tricky than the Bohr has in that it's very clearly to the reader a science fiction novel. Uh, Solaris, which sounds like it's a sun or a star, but it's actually a planet. And it's an oceanic planet, or what we, what's, we, we call with our limited vocabulary an oceanic planet. It's covered, its entire surface is covered with this kind of plasmic, undulating um, energy. And the action is quite similar to the approach of Al Mutasim. This is a novel about humanity's approach and encounter with this planet. This planet is is like Al Mutasim. It's the it's the story's explicit subject, and it's what generates the action of the story. Its mystery, its majesty, is what draws people to it. And it's sort of it's the the physical center of of the of the story. You know the story. Uh, a lot of it's set on a sort of space station just hovering over the planet for observation by scientists and it's the of course the title of the book and the subject of its speculations and generates a lot of the action of the book so there are some very clear parallels to the approach of al mutasim in fact, I mean, I said this was obviously a science fiction novel, so it's less tricky than the Borges story. But it's also the the chapter I've given you is a little bit weird. If you just encountered the chapter on its own in loose leaf paper on the subway seat beside you, you might take a while to figure out what it is you're reading, because there's most of the chapter is just this supposed excerpt from the Encyclopedia of Solaris. The Encyclopedia of Solaris is humanity's encyclopedic accounting, uh, accounting of this planet. It's, it's, it's what we've learned so far about this very sort of an anomalous heavenly body. Um, and so Stanislav Lem, the, the author of the novel, has sort of composed this sort of encyclopedia, partly just to get the reader caught up early on in the novel. I think it's chapter two of the book, just to get you, the reader, caught up on uh, where we are and what's going on with Solaris. But um, we, we <laughs> the differences between Solaris and, and Amutasim are quite dramatic too. Um, Al Mutasim transcends the story we never directly encounter. I mean, we are the care through the characters, never directly encounter Al Mutasim. But the novel Solaris pretty much begins with us right there in front of it. In fact, it's 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 super present to us. It's it's we're we're sort of overwhelmed by its presence. It's this huge planet we're just hovering over and which takes up our entire widescreen viewing window. So there's physically, we're definitely, or perceptually, we're definitely in contact with this subject. But the irony, maybe the central irony of the whole novel, 
is that it remains a kind of mystery that this is something that even when you encounter and describe positively through through the positing of factual assertions and theories about it like in an encyclopedia even when we do that we still at the end of that end of it all feel like we haven't understood it in fact maybe the more we learn about it the more of its mysteries we let out of the can and so that that i mean that might be characteristic of things which are truly mysterious to their core that you can learn specific things about them but whenever you learn a specific thing about it that raises more questions about it you know i mean uh, imagine a mysterious co-worker you know you know very little about her and then finally you learn oh she lives um she lives 20 minutes outside the city and she commutes to work every day um by go train um okay so now you now you know something about her but now now you might wonder yeah but why why does she live outside the city and da 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 and da da da, 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 da. So, so you learn you learn one thing and then that raises um a number of other questions i suppose everybody's like that i mean this, this supposedly mysterious co-worker i'm describing to you is anyone and maybe that's true that the al mutasims and the solaris and people are quite similar in that we are all mysteries um, a person is different from a uh, mm, a carbon atom i think physically present throughout we talked about that so the notion i mean to ground our uh, discussion today a little bit in uh, um, respectable academic theory i guess no better place to turn than the man who wrote the book on the holy rudolf otto this is a a, a work which was quite widely read in 20th century oh theology and um, religious studies people very interested in understanding human religiosity at the experiential level so um and this is this is what otto was really fascinated by he was fascinated by um, this experience which seems to be at, at the core of so many of our religious traditions that these religions what we end up calling a religion if you look into its history it sort of begins factually or maybe in its myth with a prophetic or mystic founder someone who's so to speak or literally gone up the mountain left you know moved away from the noise of the city or the town and gone up the mountain where they could get a clear satellite reception of this holy signal and then received the signal with clarity and power and then inscribed what they learned on a stone tablet or in a speech and then came down from the mountain and started prophesying and speaking to the people and spreading the words so the religion begins with this sort of uh what's what's I like this term vertical contact where humans have made what seems to be vertical contact a top-down signal which sort of hits them and fills them with energy and information in which they then try to translate the prophet is partly a translator to the tribe of this very strange signal this signal that's very hard to actually articulate a prophet is two things a prophet is someone who's capable of having this experience of knowing which mountain to go up and how to prepare themselves to receive this signal someone who has a relationship with this holy entity and who is speaking with it and the prophet is secondly someone who knows how to translate this effectively for the tribe um, presumably there are people who are very good at receiving the signal uh, but maybe some of them have are kind of you know they're hermits they receive the signal and then they feel they're done they uh, they don't feel the social compulsion to return to the town and speak about it or they tried that and they were laughed at 
and or they weren't very effective at it in some way. And uh, so anyway, the prophets we hear about, the true prophets, not the fakes, are um, ones who've at least in their view, you know, sincerely received uh, this signal and then have communicated it to us. And this is what Otto is very fascinated by. And I guess, you know, I haven't read this work cover to cover. I've read chunks of it, just like you're going to read a chunk of it maybe, but um, it seems part of the thesis of this work is that really um, the world religious traditions can seem quite bewilderingly various, you know, at first glance. Um, but if you dig into each, you'll find at the core of all these religions, this experience um, of the holy. And then it gets kind of the signal gets translated and expressed in different rituals and dress and language and terms. Some will call it God, some will call it the gods. Some will call it the self. Some will say it is a plenitude, an infinity, a fullness. Some will say it is a negative, a nothing, a void. These sound like the opposite. I mean, to call, is it, okay, is it a void? Is it a nothing or is it an everything? Th th that sounds like these two prophets, the, uh, say the, the Christian medieval mystic who thinks God is, an, is a plenitude, a summation of everything. And the Buddhist mystic who says God, God is not even a God, God's, it's a nothing, it's, it's a void. These views sound diametrically opposed. I think Otto would tend to the view that probably the Christian mystic and the Buddhist have encountered the same or some, you know, they both come to the core of this thing, this core human experience and um, translated it in different ways. And because it's such a weird thing, you know, um, which is so different from us, it's not surprising that people come out of that experience with very different, seemingly contradictory descriptions of it. You know? So Otto gives us this, I don't know, either handy or um, annoying Latin formula. This is the, this is your magical formula for summoning the holy or or it's at least a scholarly latin description of the holy it's auto sort of definition of the holy a mysterious you, you you know you don't need to study latin to understand what auto's saying here a mysterium tremendum et fascinans well you can see which english words these are all quite similar to this is the the if you had to pick one word, this is it. Otto's saying, what's the holy? Well, the holy is a mystery, first of all. And then if you ask, well, what kind of mystery? Otto would qualify with these two extra descriptive words. And there's a contradiction, um, which we'll talk about now. Tremendum et fascinans. So notice that a mysterium, a mystery, is something we don't know much about. And to call it a mystery is really just to say, we don't know much about it. <laughs> so we need these words that let us point to something, really, without being able to articulate exactly what it, what it is. So negative here, it doesn't mean critical, it just means like in the mathematical sense. not. It's a mystery which both repulses us. That's the tremendum part. Today, when we say something is tremendous, we mean it's great. Just like when we, uh, well, kids in the 80s, like if you watch Saturday morning toy commercials from the 1980s, you'll see wide-eyed boys looking at their new Transformer uh, mechano bot, and they go, awesome. Awesome was the word we, we would use in grade five to describe anything that was, I think today people say it's fire or it's uh, it's dope or it's, I don't know, probably showing my age here. Anyway, um, these the word awesome, <laughs> well, the word dope too means this gets me high like heroin. Um, the word awesome, if you look at, you look up the word, 
awe, the word awe, I mean, something which puts you in awe is something which leaves you speechless and terrified. And something which is tremendous also is something that makes you shake to your core, which induces tremors in you and the earth under your feet. And so the tremendum part of the mysterium is the repulsion part. Um, the mystery is something which we run in fear from. And there are many ways we can run from it. Notice that one way we can quote unquote run from it is by talking about it and analyzing it like we're doing now. Um, one way a culture deals with something powerful and mysterious is by analyzing a little bit and uh, pinning it down with these words. And that, if, like magic, it makes us feel we have some uh, control over it, some grasp of it, some at least mental um, grasping of it. Now, thinking about our, our two twinned stories, Almutasim and Solaris, I think what you want to do is apply Otto's formula to both of them. You want to, you want to ask, Okay, who's the mystery in each of these? That I think is pretty straightforward, right? I mean, it's Solaris in the case of Solaris and Almutasim in the case of the approach of Almutasim. Then ask, in what way is are we the reader and are the characters who are encountering the mystery repulsed and then attracted by to the mystery. Okay. Let's try one of them together. So in Al Mutasim, the attraction part is, is easy. Uh, the main character, this young Bombay law student, in, infers the existence of something as wondrous and holy as Almo Tassim in our world from just a little, a little gesture, a little moment he observes in a low life. He falls among low lives and thieves and murderers. And one of them one day says something or makes a little gesture that this very astute law student, this, this, observer of details and infer from details figures that gesture was so noble almost seemed to be not of this world and moreover there's no way that this low life who made this gesture is the originator of the gesture that that like so much we do in social life this uh, low life is just copying somebody else, right? I mean, it's just, it's like you might you might see someone wearing not just a cool hat, but they've got their hat kind of tipped in an angle you've never quite seen before, and it looks cool. And then you get to know this person a little bit, and they maybe don't seem all that cool or that attuned to. Um, the very cutting edge of fashion. And so you infer from your knowledge of the person and then from your admiration of the fashion gesture, you infer they didn't make this up. This is, you know, they're not the creator of this style. They're copying it from somebody. And this is what the law student does. He says, this person is copying somebody else who made this gesture. And probably it's much more than that. This person is copying a copier of a copier of a copier of a copier of a copier. And so this, this, the, the approach of al Mutasim is through these degrees of separation of the law student from the inferred originator, capital O originator of this noble gesture. So the attraction part is, um, clear. The repulsion part, 
I think it takes a little more speculation. And I'd be curious to hear what you think is the repulsive element of al Mutasim. But I think it's there. So, I mean, al Mutasim himself is not repulsive. Uh, we are drawn to him, and certainly when we're at the threshold of his um, chamber, uh, we want to go in with the character. Uh, but of course, anything that powerful, which generates light, is also terrible. Or we, we should approach cautiously and maybe remove our shoes and maybe bow our heads as we approach it. It's like the sun. The sun is maybe one of our uh, primal in, uh, examples of something that has power and which we love and we're attracted to and we want to bathe in the energy of, but uh, will burn your eyes out if you look at it directly and which uh, is very fearful as you approach it. Uh, probably there's nothing more terrible in our local universe than this volcano you know, we were circling annually. But um, notice that the law student hears of al Mutasim through these lowlifes, these murderers, these outcasts of outcasts in a caste society. And this is kind of like the, the pathway or the gateway to God being marked by fire and fearful dragons and, you know, mythical three-headed dogs. And it's it's the the pathway to the holy is sort of blocked off with all these warning signs that say, don't go this way or don't trust this way. And only the, maybe the brave of heart or the very astute observers will know how to read those signals and know that actually this is a sign of something, of something special. So maybe 99 out of 100 people who had talked to the low life and who had witnessed that noble gesture the low life made wouldn't have thought much of it or would have maybe briefly with a little glimmer of awareness said that that was kind of a beautiful move but then quickly um erased any attraction to that gesture by just connecting it exclusively to the low life who made it um so um this law student knows there's something special here, but it's not local. It's a little bit like if some of, some of you saw uh, Doctor Strange a couple years ago in in the theaters. I'm talking here in 2020. Um, I didn't enjoy that movie much, but I thought it had a really great idea, which drove the whole narrative. Uh, if you saw it, you'll remember that Doctor Strange learns of this sort of what is it, a kind of martial arts mystical monastery in Tibet. He learns of its existence through um, somebody who's had a back injury and recovered from it. Um, Dr. Strange is a medical doctor. I mean, some kind of high level research scientist who knows a lot about human physiology and about the nervous system and about the back. And when he learns that this person, this, this sort of average American, has recovered from this particular back injury. I mean, once, once Dr. Strange, whatever his name is before he becomes Dr. Strange, once he learned, once he hunts down the facts of the case and meets the person and confirms that, yeah, this person did have that particular injury and definitely did recover from it, he knows enough about the, the human body to know that this is kind of medically impossible. Like if you and I heard about this guy who had this back injury and then recovered, we'd say, oh, that's that's great. Um, but we might, we might say, well, I guess, you know, the back injury is a pretty complicated thing. Um, no back injury is the same as another and um, some might recover, some might not. And, but he knows that he knows enough specifically about the back to know that there's really no way in our current understanding of the body that someone could recover from this. It's a medical impossibility. So when this, this uh, patient tells Dr. Strange, well, I'll tell you how I recovered. I went to this 
monast this magical place in Tibet. Doctor Strange, who's this initially this symbol of Western rationalism and and uh, technical mastery, knows that I got to go to this place too. There, there's something genuine which is going on there in Tibet, which I and my science do not understand. Uh, very similar to what the law student does in Al Mutasim. He he's astute enough. We don't know a lot about him, but he's clearly astute enough to know there's something special in this symbol, and it's worth the ten-year journey to figure out its originator. Anyway, I, I, maybe I'm going on a long footnote here. We're talking about the repulsive element in uh, Al Mutasim, and um, I'm just suggesting that that it's in the swords of fire waving about at the uh, barbed wire gates that open to the path towards Al Mutasim, right? Okay, repulsion tremendum, attraction fascinans. We're attracted to it too. It's the thing we can't live with, can't live without, or can't uh, look away from, but which will burn our eyes out if we look too long. This is not just God, this is a lot of things <laughs> we like. Um, Here's, uh, if you look again after reading Otto and just, you know, getting some clarity on his distinction, then look again with new eyes at our iconography of the divine and our descriptions, our, our words. If you look at their root meanings, you'll see, and this is what Otto does. I mean, you'll see that our, our we already know this, that Otto's not telling us anything we didn't already know. He's just like a lot of academic work does, just making explicit what we already know and express in other ways, like in this. This is Michelangelo showing us God, or maybe more specifically Yahweh and the Sistine Chapel. And you can see, you know, um, rawr. I shouldn't be doing this, I guess. But, um, <laughs> in Islam, you shouldn't be drawing God at all. I'm sure in many other traditions, okay, you can draw God, but then don't draw on him anyway. Um, fair use. Um, he looks pissed off or he's concentrating. He's, I, I think at this point, is he, is he making the world at this point, <laughs> making the universe? So takes a little bit of concentration. He's a serious dude. He's a serious dude. And he's like super dad. And dad isn't just the guy who gives you piggyback rides. Dad's the guy who will um, destroy you if you do not abide by his will. Um, so this is the tremendum you know, this is the Shivic aspect of God, the destroyer, and uh, the one you should fear, right? Those who know God, fear God. Those who don't know God, love God. Those who know God, love and fear God. <laughs> They're fascinated and um, not repulsed. But fear is, a, is, is in the realm of repulsion. When you fear something, you are ever in it. Um, you are, uh, it's the body's, the body minds attempt to get you away from that thing. Awesome, we talked about. And then we've got these, if we look at the Hebrew and the Greek and the Latin nomenclature, and I'm sure beyond, um, you'll see the root meanings of a lot of these words used to describe God classically in, in you know, the Greek and the Latin and the Hebrew, some of the original early languages of, of the biblical tradition, hikdish, hollow, imat, the fear of God, orga, the wrath of Yahweh. What's, why is Yahweh so wrathful? Well, I mean, we think of his wrath as being very politicized in a lot of the stories. He's, he's angry because of very particular things we've done. He's angry at particular leaders for some of the decisions they've made and the wars they've waged or the wars they haven't waged. And, um, uh, but maybe these are just like the, ver the different dressings we put on the holy, that the core encounter is just of something terrifying. And then when we translate that into our moral categories, that, that terror takes on a kind of logic of judgment, right? And then the judgment implies punishment, but the core experience is just one of terror, right? I mean, if you encounter, a, I don't know if you get, um, I mean, if you were really close to the sun, I mean, just at the threshold of where it would incinerate you. Um, and it's burning into your brow and 
um, pulsing with power and red, yellow, white energy, you might you might feel, even though you know it's just the ball like burning gas, you might feel it's judging you. you. Can't help but feel the thing is judging you when it's putting out that much death dealing energy at you. Uh, so this is, I mean, this is Otto. I mean, he's a real scholar of of these religions of of, of the biblical religions, and he digs into some of the language to elucidate his thesis. I, I told you a moment ago that he's not telling any, any, us anything new, really, and he would be the first to admit that. And that's why he shows that in our language, we've already known this about God, the wrath of the gods. Era, era deorum. Repulsion tremendum, attraction fascinans, uh, a pair of shots from a pair of a pair of shots from Kubrick's 2001, the famous Stargate sequence. There's Starman, David Bowman. Uh, he is now alone. His crew and all of humanity have fallen by the wayside, and he is now alone in this tunnel or the Stargate, heading towards he does not know what. But he knows it's not human, it's not local. He knows it's powerful and intelligent because it has guided him and humanity here. And he he's wide-eyed. Kubrick just shows us with these primal shots, cuts, does these two shots between the Stargate and then um, Starman Dave. Dave is wide-eyed and in the previous slide um, repulsed and trying to avoid the power of the thing he's heading towards. And Kubrick's film, a little bit like Borges's story, never quite explains the thing. We never really meet the thing that the whole movie has been a journey toward. We meet its incarnation in stone, in these stone monoliths that are sort of the, both the milestones of our progress towards the thing and the, you know, I mean, and um, sort of almost like idols of the thing, those stone monoliths are just the, the picture of mystery, these black um, rectangular rocks. Mysterium tremendum et fascinant. So Kubrick has given us a very iconic imagery of the thing that Otto is talking about and Borges is talking about and uh, Lem in Solaris is talking about. 